Dr. Ethan Russo is a board certified neurologist, pharmaco um, pharmacology researcher, and medical director of Phytex, which is a biotechnical company researching and developing innovative approaches targeting the human endocannabinoid system. Uh, he serves on the scientific advisory board for the American Botanical Council. He's the author of numerous books, book chapters, and articles on cannabis, ethnobotany, and herbal medicine. It uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome him back. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Dr. Ethan Russo. Okay, well, welcome again. I appreciate the stalwarts that have uh, stayed through to the end. Uh, once again, my contact email is up here, Ethan Russo at Comcast.net. So we're going to be talking more about cannabis today and some practical issues. Um, there'll be a little disruptive technology here. I can't promise it'll be as entertaining as Dr. Caldecott. Um, I don't know if he's still out there, but uh, odd thing happened in my genealogy, and apparently I'm 2% Irish. How that happened, we can't figure out, but I'm pleased to say it. Um, First, we're going to deal with the species issue on cannabis, and uh, occasionally during this talk, I may say things that contradict some of what my colleagues have said, um, but uh, I'm just presenting one biased but hopefully educated opinion on this. There have been various ways that cannabis has been described. Um, one classification that's withstood the test of time is that from Ernest Small. This is about 30 or 40 years old, um, talking about ver different types of cannabis. Type 1 would be high THC cannabis, which is going to be the most commonly encountered in Australia and in fact most of the world due to the homogenization of the gene pool. Um, historically, however, more commonly in places where cannabis was used as a drug, would be type two. Uh, places like the old time uh, Moroccan strains or Afghan strains uh, would be a mixed population, THC and CBD, about equal. Um, type three would be more like European hemp where cannabidiol was predominant. Um, but these are worthwhile ways to describe things. Um, the cannabis controversy with respect to species starts several hundred years ago. The, the name cannabis sativa was first used uh, by Leonhard Fuchs about 250 years before Linnaeus formalized the Latin binomial way of naming species. So he's on the left there, and this is the actual botanical voucher uh, next to him uh, of cannabis sativa, which means cultivated cannabis. About 20 years later, uh, Antoine Lamarck on the right described what he thought was a different species, cannabis indica, or from India. And just as they didn't agree, there's been no uniformity of opinion on the species issues since. Um, and this isn't confined to cannabis. Botanical taxonomists just fight about names, uh, and they're constantly changing, and um, it's a problem. Um, I'm just going to back up for a second. Um, note something important, although these do look a little different, the cannabis indica that Lamarck described from India was a narrow leaflet, much like uh, the European hemp that L Linnaeus described. In contrast, um, one of my mentors, uh, Professor Schultes at Harvard, uh, pictured here uh, with his trusty guide in Afghanistan, don't try this now. Uh, it wouldn't be advisable. But he's next to a very short, squat, broad leaflet plant that uh, he called indica, which is quite different to what um, Lamarck described. His scheme was for cannabis sativa, like the tall hemp you see on the left, uh, the bushy cannabis indica in the middle, and uh, another cannabis ruderalis, an unbranched one meter plant with very low cannabinoid content. Um, so that was his scheme. But we see that things are really hard to pin down. Um, our friend David Watson is pictured here uh, with a plant that has these broad leaflets on clearly an indica um, 
by that criterion, um, if uh, you agree with Professor Schultes, but this is actually a Chinese hemp plant with huge seeds, uh, and it's very tall, like the European hemp would be. Then we have a picture from the Reef Mountains in Morocco, um, and uh, there, even though uh, genetically it's like a lot of the other uh, cannabis, it's a one meter unbranched plant because they don't water, uh, don't irrigate, don't fertilize, and that's just uh, all I can manage. Um, this has been re-examined in the last decade, and uh, a series of articles were written by Carl Hillig. He was actually trying to classify cannabis on the basis of its biochemistry, which in a lot of ways makes a, a lot more sense, uh, particularly when we're trying to deal with the pharmacology and medical uses. What this article showed was that um, all the varieties uh, that were tested had some amount of THC and or CBD, but terpenoids provided the best demarcation between the chemovars. Those are chemical varieties, or, or what some people call strains. Uh, you've seen the scheme yesterday uh, from Rob, Rob Clark and uh, Mark Merlin in their book. And this is a nice classification in that it combines a description of the plant, how it appears like narrow leaf drug or narrow leaf hemp, broad leaf drug. Um, and uh, so it has some practicality. But uh, none of this is totally satisfactory. Um, to have a good classification scheme, you'd need to describe the shape of the plant, its chemical content, and perhaps its purpose with respect to use by man. Um, it'd be good to include some measure of the basic class based on the cannabinoid profile, like type 1 for high THC. We also want to describe the morphology, the shape of the plant, broad leaflet, compact versus tall and spindly. Uh, it'd be good to have a measure of the specific cannabinoid content. As consumers, this is useful information and certainly necessary from uh, the standpoint of using cannabis as a medicine. Additionally, many of us believe that the terpenoid content are what really makes one chemovar of cannabis distinct from another. So that should be included. And it might be nice to have a description of the scent, the taste, if it's vaporized, for example, and how it might be useful. And that should be patient-oriented. The best scheme I've seen is this from NAPO Research, um, and this is uh, published information now. They have the scheme that you see on the right. It's called a phytofacts. And so it, it describes the amount of cannabinoids you get a picture of the uh, bud, unfertilized female flower and top. Um, then there's a uh, scent and taste profile. Uh, and often there'll be pictures of a recognizable plant. The lemon there means that there's limonene in it. Uh, and the, the black peppercorns mean that there's caryophylline. Then in the middle on the right, you have the effects as um, described by consumers of this particular chemovar. And you see that this one's high in comfort and energy um, and uh, it's low in relaxation, meaning it's not sedating. Then, most important, uh, in my opinion, is the terpenoid profile. If you look at the bars, it's very high in yellow. That's limonene. To me, that indicates that this would be a chemovar of cannabis that would be very good at elevating mood and also would have some immune potentiating effects. Um, the blue bar, which is very high as well, indicates that it's high in caryophylline. Caryophylline is an agonist at the CB2 receptor. It is an analgesic painkiller and anti-inflammatory agent. So overall, we've got THC, which is going to be good for a lot of things. We've got uh, the mood elevation, and the anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects. Finally, at the bottom, in purple, there's very low myrcene. Myrcene is the couch lock factor, the sedating and narcotic influence in many cannabis uh, chemovars, particularly prevalent in most drug chemovars today. It's very low, so this would be an agent that could be used without daytime sedation. 
Let's say a couple of words about land raises. These are chemical varieties of cannabis that have long been grown outdoors in a particular environment. And so they've adapted to local conditions. Uh, you know, the particular climate and particularly the predators, what bugs are there, what chemical defenses can be mounted uh, that make it adapt to that location. Um, unfortunately, around the world, in places like Jamaica, Colombia, Morocco, Afghanistan, and Thailand, these have been replaced by the seeds that everyone's using from California and from Amsterdam. So, in a sense, many wonderful, advantageous traits have been lost. Um, people that look like me with gray hair that may have experienced cannabis decades ago often wax nostalgic about how it was then um, because there were real qualitative differences in the chemical content. Um, so this just isn't a bunch of old fogies um, who don't have anything going these days. Um, there are efforts now underway to try and preserve some of this genetic legacy. Now we're going to shift gears. We're going to be a little bit hither and yon, uh, hopefully hit a few controversies. Um, this is THC alone, uh, dronabinol or marinol. Um, uh, it looks a lot like uh, fish eggs, that's, and because it's so expensive, that's why I call it the caviar of prescription medicines. In the States, this was approved uh, as a pharmaceutical in 1985 to treat nausea associated with chemotherapy, and then in 1992 for AIDS wasting. It's a slow uh, start. It could be one to three hours. It makes it very hard to titrate the dose. THC alone, unlike most cannabis, is not, doesn't produce euphoria. It tends to produce dysphoria or un unhappiness. Um, it, is uh, just used orally, and so it will be converted in the liver to 11-hydroxy-THC. There's debate about whether that's more psychoactive than THC. It's at least as psychoactive. Um, and uh, clearly lacks synergistic components. The main problem with this is people tolerate it very poorly. Uh, it has a very low therapeutic index, meaning the difference between the dose that might help symptoms and the dose that produces side effects is too narrow. The most common application of cannabis is still smoking, but almost everywhere around the world, this is still illegal, and it actually is the most likely way to produce intoxication because of the very rapid absorption. Um, you will hear that it's an advantage because it's easy to titrate, but that's not true of modern chemovars, which are so potent that one inhalation may be more than a given patient needs for their condition. It also is actually not very efficient in terms of the bioavailability. A lot of the THC or other cannabinoids that are there are lost inside stream smoke. It's not all absorbed. And then there are the obvious problems. Polyaromatic hydrocarbons that the body has to detoxify. I would reiterate that cannabis smoking without tobacco has no correlation to the production of, of lung cancer. However, uh, the body does have to process this stuff, and it obviously produces bronchial irritation with cough, sputum, and an increase in upper respiratory infections. This is not the profile of a drug that the FDA in the States or any regulatory body is likely to approve. Additionally, there are other pitfalls. Um, Currently, uh, there are many pesticides being used in cannabis cultivation, and I'm afraid the news isn't good. Uh, they're high prevalence rates. Uh, this study, um, actually, they took a variety of uh, pesticides that had been encountered in cannabis, and they put it onto the cannabis to see how much a smoking machine would yield. And in fact, as much as 70% of the pesticides that were on the material ended up in the smoke and could end up in a patient's lungs. Um, so this is very sobering data. Um, and uh, I would just say, if you didn't know already, um, I'm uh, an organic uh, farmer myself, and uh, I think that this is extremely important that consumers be aware and at least have the choice of whether to use such material or not. 
A couple of years ago, I surveyed some labs in California that did pesticide testing, and just uh, speaking to three labs, ended up with this list. I realize this is hard to read, but if you just look at the asterisks, those are the agents out of the list that are, have neurotoxicity or, um, or are organophosphates. Organophosphates are of particular interest because they, when ingested in excess, will produce seizures even in a person who had no tendency towards them. So you can imagine the danger potentially to a youngster that might be getting a concentrated this material when they have epilepsy already. Um, additionally, I would just add that uh, I've just submitted an article that includes data from Washington State where there is a legal market but no mandate to do pesticide testing. We uh, looked at 26 concentrates and flowers of cannabis from the legal market and 86% were positive for pesticides, including many bad actors like these or potential carcinogens. And it wasn't a small amount, sometimes 10,000 parts per billion, so high that the machine couldn't accurately test them any longer. Additionally, there um, could be dangers from heavy metals. Cannabis is what's known as a bioaccumulator. If there are heavy metals in the soil, they'll be recruited into the plant. Now this is great if you're growing hemp to recover a mining site and dispose of the hemp afterwards, but it's obviously a problem if it gets into cannabis used medicinally. Um, so this is a potential problem also, and there are very few labs that are testing for heavy metals. Additionally, um, people who grow cannabis don't always wash their hands, or they may be using fertilizer that is uh, contaminated um, by fecal material, so there's always the possibility of, of microbes, bacteria. Um, however, it is entirely possible to grow cannabis cleanly in soil uh, without this problem. It can be done. Um, but some nations, particularly uh, it's done some places in Canada it has been done, and in Holland they choose to gamma irradiate the product. To me it's like saying, well you don't have to bathe, we'll just cover it up with more clothes. Why not have clean culture to begin with? Now, there will people that there are people that will swear up and down that gamma radiation is safe for your cannabis. However, there's never been any safety study of gamma radiation on a smoke product, and we know that it reduces the terpenoid content. Uh, there was just a study published that uh, the idea was to mitigate the possible uh, fallout of this practice. However, one of the varieties they tested reduced its caryophylline content 10%. If you need that caryophylline for your pain relieving properties and as an anti-inflammatory, um, that could be significant. And I'd reiterate um, that the biggest problems with contamination um, and difficult growing conditions are indoors. This is a byproduct of the black market. Greenhouses are better, you can control things, there are fewer problems, but outdoors would be even better uh, for most purposes. Now let's talk a little bit about vaporization. On the upper right you see a popular device called the volcano because of its shape. Uh, this uh, puts vapor into a bag that can then be inhaled and you can dial in the temperature and these are the effects at different temperatures. First, A is un unheated, then 175 degrees Celsius, 195, and then 230, where it's obviously toasted but not quite burnt. The problem with this is twofold. Um, it's still inhalation, and because of the high peaks that we'll see subsequently on a graph I'll show you of serum activity and brain activity, uh, it gets in too fast um, and can produce intoxication. Um, regulatory bodies don't like that. Additionally, because no study of any vaporizer has shown total elimination of the polyaromatic hydrocarbons and other tar components, um, this is going to be a difficult thing to get past regulators. Additionally, um, 
it's been shown that there is the potential for a good bit of ammonia in uh, inhaled material, even when it's vaporized. And ammonia is a neurotoxin as well. Uh, these are just some ways that you see uh, cannabis sold. Uh, obviously, the sensomia buds. Um, something that has been a problem in many areas is cannabis confections that look exactly like candy bars with funny uh, names that sound like uh, uh, the candy bars. Obviously, this is attractive to children, and obviously law enforcement hates this kind of thing. Uh, additionally, there have been sprays. Um, I, I call this one, I can't believe it's not Sativex, um, but um, the technology isn't necessarily quite the same. This was a study that Arno Hazekamp and um, his colleagues did a few years back. Um, and actually, if we look, um, the majority of people using cannabis medicinally are still smoking, a uh, little over 72%. And although about 54% had tried vaporizers, only 27% preferred them. So it really hasn't gained the market share, if you will, uh, that we might hope for in, in terms of harm reduction. And in this sample, which again was a few years ago now, few were using it orally, which has advantages in terms of a longer duration uh, of action. Um, Particularly in the recreational market, um, we've had uh, two developments. One is selective breeding for ever higher amounts of THC. Also, extraction techniques to, to magnify the amount of THC. Um, Rob's book, Hashish, looked at this some time ago. And in the olden days, you could get uh, maybe 30% THC from a high quality hashish. Um, with modern techniques, you can get that up to about 60%. But that's not enough for some people. Now we have cannabis concentrates. And these go by different names, wax, shatter, dabs. Um, and on the left, there's another study uh, from Hazekamp et al. Um, they're looking at different extraction techniques with naphtha, which is a petroleum distillate, uh, with ether, ethanol, and then olive oil. Um, and these all help get things out. There's some minor differences in what gets out. Um, but generally, you need what's called a polar solvent to, to get the can cannabinoids and terpenoids out. Many of these are flammable or explosive. Every couple of weeks in the Seattle area where I live, there's a story in the paper about somebody burning down their house or exploding uh, their house um, from trying to use butane. Uh, hash oil extraction techniques. Um, so you really concentrate the THC, but often these solvents um, are not eliminated. They can't be purged entirely, and uh, particularly if somebody's using commercial lighter fluid, there are going to be contaminants there that remain in the material that's smoked. Um, there was a survey done in 2014, even people who use this material acknowledge that they develop tolerance and they had to use more of this over time to, to get high, um, and that some, some experience withdrawal symptoms. Um, I would just maintain to you that there are very few instances in which a medical patient requires this kind of material. Um, the premium should be on using the lowest dose of THC that controls symptoms without the requirement um, to produce intoxication or high. Now, I'm not going to tell you today that I think euphoria is a side effect or a bad thing, but it's not what most patients are looking for in their medicine. Rather, they want the relief of, relief of their symptoms and hopefully be able to go about their day to work or study without these other repercussions. Um, again, we have these vape pens. Um, this is a bit of a misnomer, uh, back up for a second. So you see the components of this um, on the bottom here. Um, then opening it up, you've got this wax, uh, called that for the obvious reason that it looks like it. Um, there's an unheated coil, but as soon as you press the button, this thing is red hot in seconds. That's not vaporization, that's burning. And just 
even though there's not any longer any plant material, there's just the extract, um, this is going to create funny stuff uh, in the smoke. And again, not necessary uh, for the medical effect that's desired. And it gets worse. Um, some of the material is so thick uh, that you can't work with it. And so it'll be dissolved uh, with a propellant, usually propylene glycol and glycerol. Um, this study uh, that's in the New England Journal of Medicine um, actually looked at uh, e-cigarettes, but it's the same propellant, it's just got nicotine in, in it instead. Unfortunately, a lot of the vape pens operate at these very high temperatures, like you saw the red hot coil, and when you do that, this otherwise benign propellant becomes formaldehyde, as much as 2%. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but they estimated that since this is a carcinogen, that it could raise uh, risk of cancer 15 times of that of smoking cigarettes. So right now, there might not be an obvious problem, but I hate to see what happens in 30 years if this industry isn't uh, cleaned up. Now, next one. I'll often hear from certain advocates that cannabis has no side effects. I cringe when I hear that. Of course it does. Everything does. Um, and when somebody says cannabis has no side effects, they've lost the argument. Because immediately, people who know better are going to tune them out. But what are these? Now this study I am presenting but also criticized because it was sort of lumped everything together. You've got uh, synthetic THC, you've got Sativex, you've got smoke cannabis, and it's all put together. Um, in general, at the top, uh, you see nervous system disorders, 39%, almost 40% um, reported side effects in that area. Um, and 36% psychiatric disorders. So those are the most likely to occur with cannabis, particularly in the naive user. Uh, the panic, the anxiety, um, if severe, uh, the freak out, the toxic psychosis. Other things are less common. Um, putting in, honing in on, on what's typically reported, you see the list, central nervous system effects, the things I've mentioned, also, a decrease in muscle tone, a uh, good thing uh, recreationally, a heightened sensory perception, bad thing, short, decrease short-term memory, but it could be a good thing if you have post-traumatic stress. And outside the nervous system, there's some other side effects we should mention. The rapid heart rate, again, more likely in the naive user. And if we have a high dose, like a vape pen, there have been many ER visits because of what is called orthostatic hypotension. This means that the heart slows down in this instance so much uh, that the person can't get enough blood to the brain and they pass out. Now the good part is they get horizontal, they wake up, but they may crack their skull on the way down and end up in the emergency room and it's a very serious thing. Um, this was a comparison I put together on published some years ago. The cool colors are Sativex, the orimucosal uh, spray uh, combination of THC and CBD with terpenoids that's approved in 27 countries. In the olden days, doses of up to 128 sprays a day were allowed with a very rapid titration and increase in dose. So those are the blue colors. The warm colors in this are government-approved programs of uh, cannabis in the Netherlands and in Canada. Um, these are comparable studies because they're long-term use and the side effects reported. And I realize you can't read all these, but it's all the, the usual suspects. Um, all of these are much higher in the warm colors than the cool colors except for dizziness where it's higher with Sativex than for smoked cannabis. But um, there was a difference in the program. Those are the old data. Um, if we compare this study, um, previous MS studies, uh, there were 663 patients, and then there was a pivotal study that led to approval. 573 patients, so almost as many. 
The difference is the old studies in blue um, were the high doses in rapid titration and the, the red were a slow titration with a limit a day of 12 sprays, which would be uh, about almost 20 milligrams of THC is a limited day. And you see dizziness now has been cut from 32% down to about 13%. And you have cut all the other side effects, fatigue, somnolence, nausea, dry mouth, uh, in half. So again, a demonstration that sometimes less is more. This is particularly true for cannabis where the dose is the lowest dose of THC that will produce benefit on the symptoms, and again, hopefully without producing side effects. So yes, medicinal cannabis has side effects. They're just not as bad as the ones you see described on American TV for drug ads. Now, how many have seen pharmaceutical ads on TV in the States? Well, it's good it's not more because they're disgusting. Um, they will have some poor person with um, inflammatory bowel disease that looks miserable until they take the new drug that you're supposed to ask your doctor to get, and then their life is beautiful. They're walking through the forest, and it's all sweetness and light, while an announcer in the background that you're supposed to ignore recites a litany of life-threatening symptoms from this drug. Um, so to, to be honest, there are side effects that really are not anything like we get from most mo modern pharmaceuticals when properly used. Um, I'm just going to summarize this slide, um, and I've alluded to this a little bit. Um, there's a relationship between how fast a delivery technique is for THC or cannabis and the number of side effects. And obviously something fast like inhalation produces higher levels in the blood and brain and will produce more side effects. Also, the faster it is, the better people like it if that's why they're using the drug. Uh, so obviously for recreational use, you get more people inhaling than you do using a, um, a spray in the mouth or an edible, although that's good for a longer uh, duration, like a concert. So this is, um, you saw a variant of this yesterday, and this is uh, the pharmacokinetics, uh, how things get into the blood. Now, what you've got in blue is smoked cannabis, and you see within a couple of minutes, it's spiking. Um, anything over 80 is gonna be highly desired by the recreational user, so we're hitting 160 here, that's a win for the recreational user. Um, for vaporization, it's really comparable. Um, uh, and then in green, you see what happened with Sativex. Now, this, these doses are, are tried to, uh, an attempt was made to make them equivalent, but there's a big difference. You see this low, slow hill, uh, no peak, sharp peak. Um, what's happening is that this is being absorbed through the mucous membranes in the mouth and some is swallowed in the gut, um, but it leaks out into the, the bloodstream slowly and it's going to go preferentially into the brain. Your brain's all fat, THC likes fat and that's where it goes, uh, among other places. But um, the difference is there are no spikes of activity and so even though ultimately the amount of drug that's get, getting into the body is the same, the effects in terms of the intoxication are much, much lower. That risk is lower. So um, how fast something gets in, uh, if it's faster, it produces more reinforcement, the tendency to use more and more of it more quickly. Another aspect of what's called drug abuse liability um, whether a drug is abusable or not is the develop development of tolerance. In the graph on the top, you see the number of sprays per day uh, that patients with um, MS used over the course of 75 weeks, so a year and a half. Now, this is interesting. If you had a graph for opiates for pain, typically the doses are going to go up. Not only does the dose not go up, it actually goes down over time. And the reason is the patients found that with continued use that they got by with a little bit less. 
So they went from like nine sprays a day um, down to about eight. Um, that is statistically significant. Uh, similarly, in terms of intoxication, uh, on the bottom graph on the left, uh, we're looking at a visual analog scale of intoxication. Again, anything over 20 is going to produce some effect that the patient identifies. Below that means they don't really feel it. Admittedly, these patients are on a mixture of drugs already. They, they were on antidepressants, anticonvulsants, uh, all these drugs to, to control their symptoms, but without control. Um, and so Sativex was added. In this instance, Sativex wasn't any different than placebo in terms of intoxication. Obviously, there are going to be some patients where it was different, um, but the aggregate is not. Another big controversy is danger of uh, smoking or using cannabis medicinally uh, and its effects on driving. Well, this was actually tested with Sativex. Um, patients before uh, with multiple sclerosis, uh, before they uh, went on the medicine, and then several weeks later. Um, to boil down a bunch of data, um, all of these, except the one with the asterisk, are not uh, significantly different before and after. That's a good thing. Uh, what it means was that being on the drug in doses to control symptoms didn't produce any impairment in these domains. Now, the one that was different was actually better uh, on treatment, and that's uh, called determination. Uh, the patients were trying hard and apparently succeeding in their driving efforts. From the same study, which was a couple of years ago, and looked at many hundreds of patients post-marketing with this particular agent, Sativex, um, another issue was taken up, and that is, does cannabis produce cognitive impairment give you problems with your thinking. So it's bad enough to have a chronic disease. If you're gonna superimpose problems from the drug on top of it, it's not helpful. But in this instance, again, no significant difference in cognitive ability before going on the drug and after the drug. Um, however, we then compare that to what's on the right, and you see these, this is the patient global impression of change physician and caregiver global impression of change, meaning how's daily life going? What can you manage that you couldn't before? And in each instance, there's significant improvement in the patient's status as judged by themselves, their spouse, uh, and their doctor. Um, there was a drug abuse liability study done on Nabiximol, Sativex, um, and at low doses, uh, people who customarily use cannabis couldn't tell it from placebo. So these are people that have a little bit of tolerance, at least, to THC effects. At mid and high doses, 8 and 16 sprays at once, which is not a dose that a patient would normally take. It's well above that, because most patients use 6 to 8 sprays a day for most conditions. But again, trying to produce a challenge to see what happens. Um, in this instance, there uh, was a difference from placebo, but only small differences between Marinol, pure THC, and Sativex, but when there were the differences, they were in favor of Sativex producing less drug liking and other things that would go along with whether it's going to be an abusable drug or not. Um, so just to give you context on it, um, in the states, cannabis is in Schedule One, forbidden. It's illegal. Okay, um, pure THC as uh, dronabinol was originally in Schedule Two, like uh, cocaine and amphetamines, um, but it was put in Schedule Three because they figured out that nobody wanted it. There was no black market for it. So if Sativex is less liked than Marinol in terms of being uh, a, a drug effect that a typical user of cannabis would want, uh, then it properly deserves a, a lower schedule. Um, additionally, in the program, which has now been going on for 16 years, um, 
I'm only aware of one instance of attempted abuse or diversion, and this is a picture of it. Uh, something trying to get into that vial to get at the medicine. But it turns out that the perpetrator was a little dog. Um, so uh, there's been monitoring of sites um, to find out what's going on in the, the drug user uh, arena. Um, you know, find out what the hot new trends are, and seemingly there's no black market for Sativex. So um, for people that were worried about whether this is going to be on the streets or wanted to get it, apparently it's just not that much fun. Uh, it's a lot easier to score uh, joint, spliff, whatever on uh, the street corner, I guess. Another controversy, again, has to do with is cannabis a true herbal medicine? Are there other components, or is it just a vehicle uh, for THC or cannabidiol? Um, you know, what uh, the combination uh, called the entourage effect. So this is to entourage or not to entourage. Um, on the left, you've got pure crystals of cannabidiol versus a uh, plant that produces it. Um, well, this is a demonstration. I, I think I showed this yesterday, but just to reiterate, uh, if we look at the 30% improvement um, in pain level, this is with cancer patients in hospice, um, this is considered very highly significant. In this study, in the gray is placebo, in blue is tetranabinex, a high THC extract. Um, as compared to the green, which is Sativex with a uh, high THC extract and a high CBD extract. So the only difference is the presence of cannabidiol. And all of a sudden, there's a statistically significant difference between it compared to placebo and the high THC extract. So a clear demonstration of herbal synergy. Um, again, uh, demonstration of the difference between a whole uh, plant extract of Sativex compared to THC. Um, this is a study that was looking at whether high doses of Sativex would produce cardiac conduction abnormalities, what's called the QTC uh, interval. Um, and I was aghast at the study design which required uh, for people to take as many as 18 sprays of Sativex at once. Um, but um, although one of these reactions, a toxic psychosis, somebody freaking out happened, uh, I was able to witness in Toronto, Canada, uh, with the first exposure, there were only four out of 250 exposures. So really not that bad. And again, let me emphasize, a dose much higher than ever recommended. Uh, so I put together this graph. We know that toxic psychosis has happened with THC as Marinol with as little as 10 or 15 milligrams. So you see the bar graph there. Um, the safe threshold is below 15 milligrams. Above that, you have the risk of the side effect. With Sativex, that risk goes up to 48 milligrams of THC. Uh, so that's a very considerable difference with a, a good safety margin, a better therapeutic index for a whole cannabis extract. Now, again, shifting gears. Um, I understand in this country that people who have cannabis medicine have no way to test their material. This is a real problem. Uh, again, as consumers, we'd like to have all the knowledge that we can about what we're taking and what we might need. Um, there's been a similar problem in the U.S., although there are labs, although it's technically illegal, there is the availability of testing. However, there's not a uniform methodology applied. There's also a lot of what's called dry labbing. Dry labbing means you look at the plant and say, well, it has a lot of trichomes and it smells good, therefore we're going to call this one 18% THC. And you may scoff, but this is exactly what goes on in some places. Uh, part of the problem also is inaccuracy lab to lab. Uh, the problem is there aren't good cannabinoid standards. The standard is a set amount of a test compound that you can use to analyze and compare. Uh, so that's another problem. Um, doing cannabinoid assays is difficult. Um, it's sticky material, you've got to have it mixed properly, it depends totally on how you sample it. 
But terpenoids, the amounts are much, much smaller, and these are even harder to test. Another shift. Um, you know, we, we keep hearing that we need more clinical trials, and this is true, but the, the clinical trials that have been done with herbal cannabis so far have been really problematic. And part of this is just political, what's been allowed in a given area, particularly in the states. All the studies of herbal cannabis have been very short in duration and tend to be very small in size. The material that's supplied is not standardized. Um, it's only characterized as the cannabinoid content with no terpenoid analysis. Additionally, let's say you did a study in Parkinson's disease and you got a great result and you wanted to reproduce it and develop it, develop it as a drug. You could not because you could not get the same material again um, and it wouldn't be uh, sufficiently consistent chemically to develop as a drug. So it is a system that's been designed to fail. Additionally, the studies that have been done have been poorly blinded. In other words, um, people who got the cannabis could tell it was cannabis and not placebo. Um, so the kinds of clinical trials that have been done to date have done nothing to advance herbal cannabis uh, as a, an agent that could be approved by the regulators. Now, we're going to use my friend Donald Abrams' study here as an example. He was looking at um, NIDA, that's National Institute on, on Drug Abuse, supplied cannabis in 50 subjects for three days in a condition called um, HIV-associated neuropathy. This is very hard to treat with conventional drugs. Um, the ethics committee required that everyone have smoking experience before. So this you can't generalize this to a, a general population who might have never used cannabis. If you're going to have a successful medicine, it has to work in people who've never used it too. But that wasn't tested here. Now, it did produce benefit on pain, definitely. But this is such a short duration. Normally, for this indication, you'd need a 12-week study not a five-day study. The biggest problem was the side effect profile. And if you see on the right, 25% had anxiety, 54% sedation, 16% disorientation, and 13% paranoia. I guarantee you that the FDA would not approve any drug, uh, let alone cannabis, that had this kind of profile. But this was THC-based cannabis, no cannabidiol, uh, very low uh, terpenoid content, not um, what could be done potentially. In comparison, uh, Sativex or Nabiximols, as I've mentioned, is um, from standardized strains uh, or chemovars, one high in THC, one high in cannabidiol. Um, it has uh, terpenoids. Um, it is uh, put in a vehicle with propylene glycol and ethanol, but it's not smoked, and it is safe to spray that way. Each spray gives 2.7 milligrams of, of THC and 2.5 of cannabidiol, um, and it's got a masking agent, uh, peppermint oil. Um, so its effect is intermediate. If you took enough to feel, it would come on in about 15 to 40 minutes, so it's not like smoking. Um, it does allow good d dose titration and it's been acceptable to patients, although they may hate the taste. And again, this is a variation of what I showed yesterday. If we look at just the studies in pain with Sativex, it's 6,000 patient years compared to three patient years with smoked cannabis. So there's a much better body of evidence uh, from which to draw inference. Now, having said all that, uh, surveys are very illustrative of certain points. This was mentioned yesterday. Um, this study looked at um, states with cannabis, uh, medical cannabis laws, and the mortality due to opioid overdoses, whether to heroin or prescribed opiates. Um, what we see was there was a big increase over the decade um, that's not news, but you see in the top left that it plateaued and decreased. That's what happened in the states that had cannabis available. Um, 
And so there was this clear statistical evidence, um, three chances in a, in a thousand that this was due to chance. There was a 24.8% lower overdose mortality in states that had medical cannabis available. And it was estimated in 2010 that 1,729 lives were saved because of this. Um, I will indicate to you that the same issue of this journal, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association Internal Medicine, had an editorial where they bent over backwards to try and explain this away, but none of it made any sense. Um, this is a real finding. Uh, as we've heard yesterday, cannabis may well be an exit drug uh, rather than a gateway drug where opioids are concerned. Now, a huge issue in clinical trials, um, and this is a problem overall, not just with cannabis. The mere fact of being in a clinical trial generates a certain amount of subjective improvement, meaning everybody gets better in the aggregate to a certain degree. But that's going to be worse when the randomized controlled trial lacks objective measures, like in studies with pain or of mood. You know, we don't have a painometer and we don't have a depressionometer. We've got to rely on what the patient says. You're never going to have a drug that's successful unless the patient thinks that it helps them. So it's not bad to have subjective measures, it just makes it more difficult. Um, the placebo effect is going to be greater if the drug is psychoactive, so antidepressants and cannabis. Also, it's worse if the drug has a reputation of being miraculous, and believe me, there are plenty of people that think that cannabis is. I'm here to tell you it's not a miracle. It just is a really good drug for a lot of conditions for a lot of people. That's the truth. Um, there's a very sobering study that came out a few months ago. They looked at uh, placebo responses in uh, the states uh, for neuropathic pain, and this is over the course of 23 years, and uh, the placebo responses increased a great deal, a huge amount, in fact. So at the beginning, um, where early studies might show a benefit on pain reduction by about 35%, that was down to 16.5% at the end of the time. And uh, the differences between placebo and uh, the, the drug in question also narrowed. So there, for example, in the Sativex program, there was a study of diabetic neuropathy where Sativex worked great. No, no doubt about it, it was working. But placebo worked so well, there wasn't a significant difference, and the study was a failure. Start over. Um, so this is a huge problem. Um, additionally, they found out in this study that the placebo responses increased the bigger the sample size was. Statistically, you're better if you have a bigger sample because it's more compelling. Um, also, the longer studies that are, are necess necessary that are mandated uh, by regulatory bodies also make this uh, change in placebo response worse. Um, this issue is looked at specifically with Sativex. Uh, there were no statistical differences in euphoria as one measure for those people who'd used cannabis before and those that were naive and never had experience of it, either medicinally or recreationally. Um, also, in terms of who got better, uh, improved, there was no difference between the experienced people and the cannabis naive people. Um, so that was some evidence. Um, I showed this graph yesterday. This was a randomized withdrawal trial, just to reiterate. This was in uh, spasticity and multiple sclerosis. Unbeknownst to them, initially all the patients got Sativex. At the end of a month, only the patients who had a 20% decrease in the symptoms, um, in other words, responders, were continued. Um, they came in for a resupply visit in which half of them got Sativex, the same number of sprays per day, and half got placebo instead. And then the two groups diverged so that there was a very high uh, statistical significance uh, to the difference at the end. So this is called a randomized withdrawal um, design, 
and it'd be very helpful to try and minimize some of the problems we've just described. However, it's not infallible because the same thing was done in a cancer pain study in phase three where it was unsuccessful. Um, so uh, it's not going to be the total solution either. So what can be done in clinical trials, particularly with cannabinoids, to limit these problems? First, in any clinical trial, you have to be very neutral uh, with the patient um, and say things like, this drug may or may not help you. If you say, oh, we've got this great new stuff we're going to have you try, it's definitely going to affect the patient's expectations. Um, you should avoid ancillary benefits. That means in your study, you shouldn't offer free massages at the same time as your intervention because everybody's going to look forward to their next visit. Um, it also is very helpful to have a slower delivery technique. So inhalation is problematic as compared to oral, for example. Additionally, it's very helpful to have um, agents, whole cannabis, uh, for example, that have terpenoid and cannabidiol buffers that will attenuate the effects of THC on intoxication. So where are we now in terms of proof of cannabis? We've got solid evidence for this last, nausea and vomiting, um, anorexia associated with chemotherapy and HIV AIDS, um, spasticity and MS and other conditions. Uh, there's been a study of cerebral palsy in children with Sativex. Uh, neuropathic pain, whether central or peripheral. Cancer pain and lower urinary tract symptoms. For cannabidiol, we have uh, clinical trials with success in intractable epilepsy, specifically Dravet's. Um, also schizophrenia, both on positive and negative symptoms. Um, clinical research priorities. And so, you know, for when you're talking to people in charge here, what's needed in Australia and the rest of the world, um, more studies on pain and inflammation. Remember, pain uh, in surveys is 70% of patients using cannabis, particularly in conditions that haven't been studied yet. Uh, all the types of arthritis, rheumatoid and osteo, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, um, metabolic syndrome. Um, most of the Australians I see are pretty trim. In the States, I can tell you that we're killing ourselves with food. Uh, and over 50% of the population is obese at this time and headed towards uh, type 2 diabetes. So this is a huge problem. Uh, as you've heard, cannabis is great for the skin, various conditions. Um, potentially a very good neuroprotective agent, uh, maybe a preventive in the future for dementia, uh, traumatic brain injury, and strokes. And then there are things could be done uh, to optimize endocannabinoid health, like the dietary manipulations we, we mentioned yesterday, other lifestyle approaches that might reduce the need for cannabis, or at least the, the dose that's needed to control symptoms. What we need now is more uh, standardized, good manufacturer, manufacturing practice cannabis where we know what's in it, appropriate cannabinoid and terpenoid profiles. And we need some genuine advanced stage clinical trials that meet regulatory standards um, and aren't just going to be relegated to anecdotal labels. We don't need a lot more case studies. These are interesting. It's all people can manage sometimes within the constraints in their country or budgets. Uh, we don't need a lot more surveys. The surveys are very compelling as it is. We also don't need more studies in the states with NIDA cannabis that can't be developed or characterized. Um, we don't need to waste public funds. To conclude, uh, cannabis has proven medical potential and has led to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system, a major uh, physiologic homeostatic regulatory mechanism. Uh, cannabis in a proper formulation can become an approved pharmaceutical in the U.S. or around the world that fulfills necessary criteria of safety, efficacy, and consistency. And just a few final thoughts. Um, and some of this is redundant. I'll skip the ones that are. 
Um, I hope that I've emphasized to you that one cannabis preparation is not like another. So if one is approved as a pharmaceutical, it doesn't mean it's going to change the scheduling or status of another. Each is going to have to prove its um, efficacy and safety in the marketplace. Uh, again, the clinical trials to date have mainly been too short, too small, and employed unstandardized material with unreproducible results. Um, we've got a problem in our clinical trials with blinding and excessive placebo responses. Um, hopefully as a parting message, you'll keep smiling because there are other ways to the goal of optimized endocannabinoid system health. And I'll thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Russo. Well, uh, that's our final uh, educational speaker. I'm going to invite Lucy up to say a few words uh, just in closing. So, uh, ladies and gents, Lucy Haslam. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for staying till the end. Um, I think you all agree that it was worth, um, worth being the diehards. Thank thanks for ringing the bell for me, David, but I haven't finished. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank Tim for being our host for the weekend. Um, you've done a fantastic job and I hope you're available for the next one, hopefully in Melbourne. Uh, it's a bit hard to sum this up briefly, but you know, for me there's been some very high points and there's been just a couple of low points. So just in summary, um, I want to thank our speakers, in particular our international speakers. You know, Ethan Russo has come here for two days. He was in Paraguay a few days ago. You know, here he is and he's going back to the States for his wife's birthday. You know, so thanks to Mrs Russo for letting him come. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Um, thank you everybody else for coming from Spain and Israel and, and the States and thank you to our, all our Australian speakers and it just really makes, it reinforces for me that you know we have great, we have great talent in Australia, there's great interest in Australia and we can do this ourselves with the help of our colleagues who have now agreed to collaborate and you know that's invaluable so thank you for that. So for me, another highlight has been um, the confirmation from the Premier yesterday that they're going to review the Terminal Illness Cannabis Scheme and get rid of that name. So that hopefully will begin tomorrow with a, a meeting that we'll be taking part in. So that's been a, a, you know, a highlight for me. It really needs to go from being a Terminal Illness Scheme to being a Compassionate Users Scheme and that can't happen quick enough. Um, just, I just want to touch on low points because I think um, it's worth mentioning. For United in Compassion, we feel that the way to move forward is to do it slowly, to do it well, but to do it respectfully. And you know, over the course of the last couple of days, people have thanked me for keeping the price of this low and affordable, so so many more people can come. And that you know that was a name, but. That couldn't have happened without Premier Baird, who was here yesterday, um, being heckled from the crowd. And for me, that was a low point because whilst I appreciate that things happen slowly and it's frustrating, particularly as a parent, and I've been in that, I've been in those shoes, and I know that journey, and it's a pretty hard place to be. But I think the fact of the matter is we've come so far in the last 18 to 20 months. There have been people that have adv been advocating for medical cannabis and cannabis generally for the last four or five decades. And they've done it in a way that's been disrespectful and has actually kept us in a holding pattern. Well, this is purely my view, but it's kept us in a holding pattern far longer than we needed to be. So I feel we need to be thankful for the, the small gains that we're making and in being thankful and in being respectful uh, I think that that is probably the best way to move forward and so that's the way that United in Compassion will continue to move forward. Um, we will have our critics and I appreciate that but I just wanted to pass on that for me I was sad yesterday that the main focus of 
having these wonderful speakers here was, you know, that I saw reflected on media on the television last night was the heckling that was happening to the Premier on his way out. And rather than talking about the fantastic presentations that we were being given, you know, from people like Bonnie Goldstein and, and Ethan and Geoffrey Hergenrather, we were focusing on the negative, you know, heckling and um, you know, for me, that was an absolute low point. So I just wanted to share that. I don't want to end on a positive, uh, on a negative note. Um, it's been fantastic, and I'm so pleased that everybody made the effort to come. And please, you know, go forward and spread the word. Um, I just probably on one one final thing uh, that was a little bit of the low was the fact that we only had a couple of doctors here, and that you know. For me, you know, we did target doctors. We did try and get doctors here. So to have, have only a few in the audience is, you know, is a little disappointing. But just to finish on a high, we've got David Caldercott on our side. And oh my God, isn't he dangerous? And absolutely better to have him with us than against us. So um, with that, I'll leave you. And thank you very much. Okay, folks, that uh, does bring to a close the 2016 United in Compassion Medic Medicinal Cannabis Symposium. Um, I just wanted to introduce you to my little girl, Arielle, um, and just say that, uh, yeah, I mean, as you, as you leave here, you're, you're going to hear this notion, obviously pushed by us and many other people, and hopefully it's not, doesn't end up being used as a political football, but the notion of compassionate access and uh, what it really is about is about people like her and the thousands of kids out there that can be helped by cannabis and that it makes a real difference in their lives. And I just want to leave that with you and thank you all so much for being a part of this. Thank you to all our contributors and everybody that's come from overseas. It's been absolutely wonderful. And thank you to Lucy and Lou and Troy uh, for allowing me to uh, be a part of it because it's been a great privilege and, and I thank you all very, very much. Bless you all. And thank you.